Hello. Let's pick up where we left off last time. The secret of the magic of life consists in using action in order to achieve non-action. <laughs> the secret of the magic of life. Okay, so there is a magic of life, and there is a secret to it. Of course, all magic has a secret. Arthur Clarke very famously defined magic as any technology which is sufficiently advanced beyond yours. So yes, there is a magic of life, but it's a secret. Only the adepts, only the initiates know this secret. Ordinary science tries to prove everything by external evidence, by so-called objective measurements and so forth. But the interpretation of those measurements is always subjective. It's always based on the scientist's understanding. There are many instances where scientists went back with better understanding and reevaluated earlier experiments and got a completely different conclusion. So what does this mean? There are people in this world who are self-realized. There are people in this world who are enlightened. Now, orthodox religionists may deny it. Scientists may deny it. Philosophers may doubt it. Huh? Ordinary people may argue against it. But there's magic. And there's a secret. It's an open secret. It's talked about in all the holy books. But the holy books are written in code. Why are they in code? Well, one thing is the limitations of language. Our language doesn't have adequate terminology to describe the inner life. But beyond that, only one who is experienced in these things, only one who has a direct personal knowledge of these things, could understand that language anyway, even if we had adequate terminology. So, as a shortcut, the uh, sutras, scriptures, use secret codes, terminology. The golden flower is one such secret code. If you know, if you have the experience, and it's immediately apparent what the meaning is, but if you don't have the meaning, or sorry, if you don't have the experience, the meaning will be very elusive. You wind up guessing. And we'll see a little bit later on a very good instance of that right here in the text. So what is this magic of life? It's using action to achieve non-action. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Sounds contradictory sounds impossible. But let's go back and put this in the terminology of the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha would say the same thing as using the process of becoming paticca samupada to reach the end of becoming. In other words, using action to achieve non-action is the result of a process a process of becoming. Becoming what? Becoming enlightened. Ordinarily, the process of becoming simply leads to rebirth. That's because we miss, we didn't become enlightened, and so our only choice is to go back and create another body and try again. But if you know this process, if you know how to use it, you can reach a state where it's not required where there's no more karma, where you can decide, you can choose, you are free to come or not to come back again into manifestation. So, in the Buddha's case, this is the Eightfold Noble Path. Now, the Eightfold Noble Path is stepwise, eight steps. And the first step is right view. Some people like to try to cut right to the chase. And the next verse 
talks about this. One must not wish to leave out the steps between and penetrate directly. <laughs> so don't leave out the in-between steps. Some people want to go directly to meditation. But meditation, or concentration actually, is the eighth step of the path. If you don't get the first step right, how are you going to get the last step right? So right view is critical. If we have a wrong view on things, then all the other steps won't work. No matter how hard we try, we won't get the result. And this is what's going on, isn't it? In Buddhism now they say, oh, nobody can become enlightened anymore. It's too late. Buddha's gone. The teaching's degenerate. The monks are all phonies. <laughs> they don't say it like that. But what they say, in these days, one cannot become enlightened. So the best that we can hope for is to do a bunch of rituals and hope that we can generate enough good karma to come back in the next life and have a chance. This is bogus. If this enlightenment is real, if this path actually leads somewhere, then it will always work in any circumstance, in any condition of life. That's why it's enlightenment. Huh? No matter where we're coming from, no matter which direction we approach the truth, we can approach it and we can get the result. Now, if we have a wrong understanding, that will stop us. And what have the priests been doing? What have the monks been doing all these centuries since the Buddha? Simply obfuscating his teaching with all kinds of nonsense commentaries. So now remember in the beginning, I said this is a one-step process. <laughs> so what is this about doing all the steps of the path? Huh? Because, well, let me give you an example. Let's say I use a ladder to climb up on the roof. Now, from the rooftop, looking down, I can say, I climbed up with the ladder, one step. But for someone on the ground, trying to climb up using the same ladder, he has to go step by step by step. He can't omit any of the steps, or he won't be able to climb. He won't be able to reach the top. So we say, yes, it's a one-step process. Once you realize it, then looking back on it, you say, oh, yeah, that was easy. Just turn around. But in practice, one begins to turn around one area of life and then another area of life, this chakra, then that chakra, and so on, until the whole is realized. Even in the Buddha's path, there are four stages of enlightenment, four paths. First path, second path, third path. And full enlightenment is only reached when you get to fourth path. If you try to skip the stages in between, you won't be able to get it. You'll get something, huh? but it won't be the true enlightenment. It's going to be some concoction, some error. So to continue, the maxim handed down to us is to take in hand the work on the essence. In doing this, it is important not to follow the wrong road. Good advice. If you follow the wrong road, it will take you someplace. It just won't take you where you want to go. So we want to follow the right road. And what is that? Work on the essence. We have essence and we have personality. We have being and we have activities. Personality is about our activities, our identifications, our roles in the material world. It's not who we really are. Who we really are is the essence, the self. Olden times, it was called the soul. 
But that gives the idea of eternality, and, and there is no eternality. Eternality is a myth. So the essence is the pure awareness, the golden flower. Awareness without any object. Once awareness has an object, it becomes consciousness. And that's another cause of becoming. The golden flower is the light. The golden flower means the thousand petal lotus, the top chakra at the top of the head. This is always enlightened. But we are not in touch with it. We are looking the other way. We're looking down. We are all Buddhas. We have always been enlightened. The problem is, we're looking away from it. We're looking out into the world. We're looking for objects. We're trying to find things. We're aware of different states of being. But we're not aware of the source. The source is the golden flower. The source is pure awareness, unconditioned being. Now, as soon as I say light, you're thinking of light, like the light that's shining over there and hitting my face so you can see it on the camera, on the video. But this is not the same thing. The light that we're talking about in context of the golden flower is the light of awareness. You do not see something without light. If this room was completely dark, the frame would be black. You wouldn't be able to see me talking. As soon as there is light, then everything becomes visible. So in the same way, as soon as awareness touches an object, it illuminates it. It makes its existence plain. Otherwise, there can be doubt. Is this real? No. Similarly, until you experience these things for yourself, there's always going to be some doubt, some uncertainty. So we are emphasizing light because light is awareness. It illuminates the whole world. The light of our awareness illuminates the whole universe. Just think of it. The whole universe shows up in our awareness, isn't it? Everything. Now, we have narrowed down our awareness until it's just about the body and the senses and the mind. But that doesn't mean that awareness is limited to that. That was our choice. That was our mistake, if you will. We narrowed down our awareness. We shut down the light focused it on just a few things instead of the whole. So that's why he says work on the essence, because the essence is already connected with the whole. As it is now, we have become disconnected. We've lost our connection with nature, with the whole, the existence, and so we feel lost. This is despair. This is the worst kind of suffering, that there's no hope. So because we doubt these internal realities and we don't pursue them, we have no experience. So how can we resolve our doubt? We have to practice something. And the practice begins with right understanding, right view. As soon as we get right view, we have what's called the Dhamma Chakku, which means the eye of the Dharma. We understand Buddha's teaching. We understand what is, how it is, and why it is the way it is. Then we can do something about it. Until then, we can't do a thing. Now, what color is light? Well, the image of the golden flower might be a little tricky, might be a little deceptive. It's not a golden light. 
light is colorless. That's why light doesn't show up in space. So you don't see the light traveling through the air until it hits an object and reflects. Then you know there's light. Then you can see the color. Until the light hits, it's colorless. So pure awareness without any object is also like that. It has no qualities. It's like a mirror. That doesn't mean it is a mirror, <laughs> but it's like a mirror. A mirror reflects whatever you put in front of it. It doesn't think, well, do I like this or do I not like this or do I want to change it in some way? No. A mirror, if it's a good mirror, simply reflects the object with the same color, the same shape, without introducing anything of its own. This is awareness. This is the light that we're trying to find the pure, clear light that illuminates everything. So, the light is the true power of the transcendent Great One. How does the Great One create? By light. Let there be light. Huh? And of course, the science of astrology is called Jyotish. Jo, Jyoti means light. And Ish means the controller. So Jyotish, the controller of light, is the great one, the creator. Huh? This universe was created from light. <laughs> Nothing but light. And now science is confirming this. So we know this book is true. But it requires an enlightened being to bring out that light so we can see it. The light itself is colorless, invisible. But when it's mirrored by the mind of an enlightened person, then we can see. Then it becomes tangible. Then it becomes real. Then we see, oh, someone is knowing these things. If he can, I also can. And that's true. Religion tries to make the founders the enlightened beings, unreachable. They're so great. They're so far beyond. And they cook up all kinds of stories and legends to prove it. Like when Buddha was born. Supposedly, as soon as he was born, he immediately took seven steps. And then he declared, I am the greatest enlightened one. You know, what was he, Muhammad Ali or something? <laughs> Come on. Buddha was an ordinary human being. Osho is an ordinary human being. Huh? Jesus and Mahavir and all of these great teachers and preachers are all just ordinary human beings. There's nothing special about them at all. I'm just an ordinary human being. I get up in the morning, I have to go to the bathroom, then I have to eat something, otherwise I can't work. No superpowers here. No superpowers in any of them. When you read the flowery words in the scriptures, this is all ornamentation. This is just uh, window dressing to get you to come into the store and buy something. <laughs> come on, people. Don't fall for these tall tales. Huh? That's what I like about the secret of the golden flower. It's so ordinary. It doesn't have a bunch of rules. It doesn't have a bunch of esoteric, hard to understand formulas. It doesn't require any tremendous superhuman qualities or efforts. It's something that an ordinary human being can do and reach and attain. And we should. We should try to attain it. Now, here's the punchline. I love this. The phrase, the lead of the water region has but one taste, refers to it. <laughs> Come on. This has got to be an error. The lead of the water region? Oh, come on. And especially since there is such a well-known saying, the salt of the ocean tastes the same everywhere. Huh? Who hasn't heard this? 
If you haven't heard this expression, you haven't been involved in spiritual life for very long. The ocean tastes the same everywhere. The salty taste of the ocean. Huh? So everywhere you go, it has the taste, this taste of light, this taste of the golden flower. Once you come to know it, you can perceive it everywhere, in everything, and in everyone. And then you will know that everyone is a Buddha. <laughs> you are a Buddha. And you are enlightened. All you have to do is remember it.